Alrighty, good morning. Right, I know a number of people will join us a little later. I did promise that I will be doing part two. So this is the second part and uh, this is when I actually am inspired to do it. As always, you catch up as you come live and catch me as I go to my second testimony. Those of you who joined yesterday, I did share my first testimony. You'll find it on my Facebook page. I've been asked whether I can share that on Facebook. Yeah, I'll probably post it. Uh, but not just yet. Now, uh, very quickly, yesterday I shared my first part of my testimony and that part was about um, the time that, who I was, my background, leading up to the time that I became saved and born again, the experience I had, the supernatural encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ preceded by my being baptized in the Holy Spirit and receiving the Lord as my savior. So I had that experience, it was very profound. It is shared in the previous video. Today I'm doing the second part of my testimony. And uh, this testimony will run from the time I received Jesus, literally the 22nd of June, 1997, all the way to the 21st of July, 2007, the next 10 years. And what exactly happened to me? And why am I sharing this testimony? Because many have been asking me for years, what's your story? What's your testimony? How did you come to, to become a born again Christian? What's your story? And uh, so this helps you to understand my background. So those who followed me yesterday, you know that I shared with you that I came from an occultic background. I came from a background where I was deeply steeped in the occult. I practiced every manner of occultic uh, practice. The only thing I never went into deeply is what I call Satanism, what you would call, yeah, literally Satanism. The use of occultic uh, practice with rituals and blood, I, I never went that way. I, I, something just didn't allow me to go into that level. I also testified to you about the fact that a, a deep, uh, what would I call them, mystic, uh, told me that I'm not part of them that you're not one of us. And that was told to me when I wasn't even saved. So you can imagine that. So I get saved. I meet Jesus in my room. What happened? Okay, so in that first week, you know, something profound happened. I remember that morning after burning all my occult books and everything, I went, and that, by the way, was such a shocker. They, somebody even phoned the power fire brigade. Somebody's burning a bonfire. I know in the UK, they are so different. So I said, somebody's burning a bonfire at the back of the house. But the truth is I was burning all my occultic books. That's pretty much how I burnt and destroyed my books on demonology, my aspect charts on astrology, my books on palmistry, my books on, um, on magic, sacred geometry, my books on Gnostic learning and understanding, my books on deep level med meditation, transcendental meditation, astral projection, all my books from the Theosophical Society by Ledbetter, by uh, Blavatsky herself, by um, Bailey, by um, other writers I've forgotten now, but there were a good number of writers whose books are now in public domain that were part of the studies I did. I did not, I, I did not find Alistair Crowley exciting because like I told you, there was something within me that just made me so uncomfortable with that level of uh, occultism. Anything that involved sex magic and sex rituals, anything that involved blood, just something in me just made me uncomfortable with it. And that's how I came to know later that it's because of the work of my grandparents, the, the work they did in coming to know the Lord. Hey, Musunga Kapaya, good to see you here, brother. So, now, there I am. So I take my music back to my brothers and my friends. And they, this is a real story. My brother Leslie is still there in the UK. My dear friends, uh, Agatha Piri and her sister Pauline Piri. Uh, the, these, these were part of a group called Pink Cadillac. A number of people who were from that era would testify. Good friend of mine, Wana Kalala, uh, Martin Mwesa, and that whole group were part of the pink Cadillac, and, 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 and we were all part of that early group of musicians from the 90s that were doing music in this country in those days and breaking grounds. And so I, I, I went to them and I remember handing them all my music with my brother. 
My brother gave me a two hour lecture on how lost I was. My, my, my friends, Agatha Piri and them laughed at me and said, we give you two weeks. Like I keep saying, it's now 27 years from that time. I never went back. And you know, uh, when, when I gave that music away, well, when I look back, I wish I didn't because I would have kept that as a testimony to show you guys that this is the background I'm coming from. But obviously, nobody will know that now. So when I gave that music back, I then told the Lord, I remember this. I said, Lord, where to? And you know, God is amazing. I, I want to tell you guys, I actually feel very emotional about this. God is amazing because what he did, he knew I was a skeptic. He knew I had an occultic background. He knew how I, I told you the testimony. He knew how I looked down on, on Christians, especially born again, Pentecostal, charismatic Christians. I really looked down on those people. I thought they were so fake. You know, I thought they were so corny. And so God in his wisdom put me in the, in the tutelage of a great man of God. I honor that man so much because that man mentored me. And like I say, God placed me before somebody that was intellectual sound because I am a skeptic by nature. And so I, I needed somebody to help me navigate the very confusing space I was in now because... Uh,
my devotion. I finished. I'm sitting waiting for the Lord now to speak to me. And I tell you, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, something profound happened. I am just sitting there and I open my eyes. I believe I was in a trance. I open my eyes and boom, there's a person in the room. Now, it would be really strange to tell you who the person I saw was. Um, no, for the sake of fairness, let me not mention the names. But it's actors. Every time the devil appeared to me, he appeared in the form of actors I know. So the first form he appeared was a well-known black actor. We all love him. He's a comedian. So he appeared in the form of that man. But I knew immediately it wasn't him. So then he says to me, oh, what, Walter, you, there you are. How is your devotion? I go, well, it's great. And obviously, I'm not, I'm not reacting to the, the fact that there's a man in my room. I felt like there's something transcendental about it. It's not normal. It's not ordinary. It's my room, yes, but there was something different about the room. And he's there. And he says, how's your prayer? I said, great. He says, how's it going? Oh, no, awesome. I've just finished reading John chapter 5, I think, or chapter 6. So he says, and what do you understand about it? And I said, well, I mean, it's just a great message and I'm really feeling what the Lord is saying to me. He says, okay. And then I said, but how are you here? And he said, well, I'm here. And so I go, wow, are you an angel from God? And he says, me, an angel from God? And then he, he chuckles. And then I say, are you not an angel? And he goes, he laughs again and says, if you think God can actually send an angel to you, you have another thing coming. I, I so remember that. And then it caught me. I'm like, so you're not, before I could even finish the word, so you're not an angel. This man then begins to transform into a dragon, like a really scary looking dragon-like creature. And I go, oh my God. And so before I could say any words, something like a tentacle comes and caught my mouth, like boom. So I couldn't speak. And then... He opened his mouth and the double tongue came out and the tongue tips went through my nose. I was so really, now I was freaking out. I was like, oh, this is the devil. And be before I could pray in the name of Jesus or say anything in the, of that sort, this tongue had gone into my, um, into, into my, um, um, into my lungs. And then that, that hand went inside it's like something inside the hand went in my in my mouth and they blocked my passages so now i couldn't breathe and i couldn't shout and i was trying to call out the name of jesus but i couldn't call out the name of jesus and so it was a very scary experience and at that point i felt someone in my heart speak and i believe it was the lord the lord said to me begin to call my name in your heart so then I began to speak or call out his name in the name of Jesus Christ. And by then I just come from reading Acts chapter 4, 5 or 6. I can't remember. But the passage about the time when, uh, when uh, uh, Peter and John were headed into the temple to pray. And there was a poor man who was literally by the temple. And the Bible tells us that that man uh, then asked for something. And then the disciples... Peter said to the, to the man asking, he said, look at me. And then the man looks at Peter and then he says, silver and gold I do not have, but that which I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And you see, the revelation Jesus gave me at that point was that it is actually Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's very specific. It's Yehoshua Hamashiach. Jesus the anointed or Jesus Christ. Jesus the anointed, which is Yehoshua Hamashiach. Yehoshua is the name. Hamashiach is the Messiah. So Jesus Messiah. It's so specific. And that's what I was given as revelation. So on that moment when the devil was choking me and, and laughing and telling me that there is no God coming to save you. I then began to call out the name of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth in my heart. And I began to sense those things come out of my mouth and the, the things coming off. And I kept saying it and I kept saying it in my heart. And then those my things came off. And then now I spoke it in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You are disabled. You have no power over me. The Lord surrounds me. I just found myself saying all these words 
that had to do with my asserting of my authority in Christ. Now, these are things I just read one, two weeks plus going to that church. And I, I, I sensed already that's what to do. And so this demon being, now half a human and half a being, then said to me, and this was so critical. He said to me, Walter, you are so blessed because of what you hold on to. But mark me, mark my words. The day you come out of what you are, you will find me. So that was the first encounter. And then I just say, be gone and boom. You know, and, and that's, uh, that's when it now hit me. And you know, when, when I looked at my clock at the time when the trance began, because I was looking at my clock to mark it, because 8.05, I used to leave the house. When I looked at the clock, it was 7.56. When this thing finished, it was 8.01. It felt like it was 30 minutes, but it was actually just three, four minutes. It was unreal. And so that was my first encounter. Then about four weeks later, I had a second encounter. Again, on that particular day, remember I told you my room had so much peace? So I had to go in there and sit in my room and I would sense the presence of God and go through my devotion. So the second time, uh, I failed to do my devotion that morning. So I had to do it in the evening. So there I am in the evening. I said, before I sleep, I make sure I do my devotion and then I'm going to put my worship music and then I'll sleep with worship music because that's, that's what I... I used to feel better when you just play the more worship music. Like, oh, I've been in the presence of God. I, I know now better, but hey, it worked. It did wonders for me. And, and to this day, the worship music still creates an atmosphere. So there I am. And I'm, I'm, I'm in that state and I've done my, my scripture. I've finished and I'm just sitting there waiting for the Lord to speak to me. And as I am waiting for the Lord to speak to me, I find myself in a dark corridor. Like, and you know, I... I always wondered, am I in a... But I always need a trance. It would just literally be a trance. So I'm sitting there and boom, I'm in this dark corridor. And as I'm in this corridor, I see another actor, very, very beloved actor. People love this guy. This time a white guy. And he's standing right at the end of the, of the alley looking at me. And I go... Now this time around, I didn't... I didn't even doubt it. I just knew straight away, this is a trance. This is not God. This is the devil coming again. And so there he is. He's looking at me and I'm looking at him. I'm like, oh. And so immediately, this time, I didn't want to entertain him. You see, because um, that's another thing that for some powerful reason, the Lord showed me. That you don't have conversations with the devil because the devil is the father of lies. And there is nothing the devil is going to say to you that is not tainted with a lie. Every part in scripture where the devil has spoken, he always brought a lie. He said the truth and then touched a lie in it. And so many people who didn't realize they got deceived by that. And that's what uh, the devil is very good at. And so immediately I just went into, because, you know, being charismatic and coming from that Pentecostal background, we just go straight into starting to rebuke. But before I could start, then this, the devil told me, hey, <laughs> wait. And so for some strange reason, I stopped to listen to what he had to say. And he says, before you rebuke me out of here, I want you to know that I am watching you and I am following you. And the day you leave, my friend, you have me to contend with. I say, be God.
all premature the, the death the early death of a saint i'm paraphrasing it comes to protect that saint from evil days ahead and so god in his grace chooses to take that saint away before they go into really terrible apostasy unless they were not his to begin with so I believe that that's what the devil said to me. These things are very subjective. We can argue all day. I know what I experienced. And that's how my encounters with the devil were. And it is that. Let me not lie to any of you guys. It is that that kept me. More than anything else. I, yes, it's God who keeps us, I believe. It's God who keeps us from evil. It's God who keeps us from, from, from um what I would call apostatic sin. Apostatic sin is the sin where you literally reject God. Like you literally spit in his face and say, to hell with you, God, take your Jesus with you. I don't care anymore. When brothers like, I'm sorry to say this, but I've got to say it. When brothers like Elder Maponga speak the way he speaks, for me, he's a borderline apostatic man. You reach a place of apostasy. If you're going to mock the Lord and Savior, what you're doing is mocking the Holy Spirit. When you mock the Holy Spirit by saying, take your rubbish away from me, you have literally cast off the only being that can keep you, which is the Holy Spirit. Okay? So once you do that, that's gone. You're, you're gone. I don't see how you'll ever be saved. That's why Jesus said, the sin against the Father will be forgiven. The sin against the Holy Spirit will be forgiven. But the sin against, sorry, the sin against the Father, sin against the Son. But the sin against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven in this life or the next. Why? Because it is the Holy Spirit that convicts us to know God. When I talk about I hear the voice of Jesus, well, that's the Holy Spirit at work inside of me. And that's what it was, my dear brothers and sisters. So he told me, you, you, the day you leave, you're dead. Somebody's asking me, how can you know somebody's died prematurely? Before their age. I believe everybody's given 70 years. That's what the scripture teaches us. Anybody who dies after 70, I believe they've fulfilled their life according to scripture and according to Psalm. But anybody who dies before 70, it's not their time. Unless it's ordained it be that way that they'll be martyred. You know, if you're going to be martyred or if it's just God who says, I'm taking you away from here, you know. So that's what it is. Uh, to my brother Jonathan, he has renounced God. I have videos where he has literally called Jesus, this, this, this person, this white blonde guy, this, who is this? This is not God. He has said it in a very, very clear way, not, not to be minced or confused. He's even said that that Jesus, I don't know him. Those are his words. So we're not putting words in the elder's mouth. So anyway, so that was my experience with the devil. Now, fast forward to 2005. Um, uh, I got ordained in 2003, by the way. We, we got into ministry. Besides doing business, one thing I did is the people around me spotted my gift and said, you are a gifted man. You need to get into ministry. So fast forward, I got ordained. I got in ministry. In ministry, I did a lot in ministry. I did works with my brothers in ministry. Okay? So in that period, uh, we began to do ministry with my dear friend, Pastor Peter Kavamba. We had a very effective prayer ministry in this country. We started running what was called Peaceful Mission. At the peak of our ministry, we were at five to 700 people on a Friday doing prayers. My dear friend, Pastor Peter, who was the one who used to do the pastoral stuff, I've never been moved to do that stuff, right? So he's the one who was doing the pastoral stuff. We used to have queues that used to go to see Pastor Peter every Tuesday and Thursday as he lived at, um, God bless her soul, but the Madam Shekapwasha's house. Uh, Mama is Chika Pasha. She was a she was a trainer, a lecturer at uh, Lusaka Trades, and we used to meet at Lusaka Trades. So that's the time we did a lot of ministry. Then we moved to YWCA. We grew bigger, and at that time I began to seek God deeply about what He wants me to do, and that's how I connected myself to a great man of God. I won't mention his name because of what happened to him later, and I became a great, great committed servant there. I did everything there is to do. Let me give you an idea of what, of what was going on then. And so I'll rush this and close. <coughs> because I need to get to my epiphany. There are things I did in that time. Number one, my mom and I were so deep into the service and work of God. We used to lit, we had seven pastors at the peak of our ministry and our business rather. We had seven pastors on payroll. We used to pay them seven pastors, literally on payroll, besides our tithe. We would give all these pastors because we believed they were servants of God and we needed to support what they were doing. So we put them on payroll, one. Two, we were tithing. 
like serious tithing. Even now, I still do. So I, I, I will never stop. Three, we supported the ministry of the servants of God. Okay? So, <clears throat> and, and, and in, so, in so doing, this supporting of the work of God really led us to a place where we had so much going on for the sake of the work of God. We had big business. Our business was above a million dollars a year. Okay, so big business all over. And uh, at that time, I then joined this ministry with this great man of God. I became a very committed saver, a server in that ministry. I was so committed to the process of serving God. And I really believed in what that man stood for. He flowed. He was such a great servant of God. By the way, I've had my fair share of sitting under <laughs> the Papa move, movement. I won't go into that. But this particular man of God, I bless my heart. And I believe he still has his gift. But unfortunately, what happened to him happened to him. I'll tell you the story. So I served in that ministry. And you know, at the time I was married already. But one thing that I did, which <clears throat> I believe I attributed greatly to, the, to, to my divorce, is that between serving ministry and doing business, I had no time for my family. I'll, I'll just be, I, I always like to own up. I don't want to make excuses. I had no time for my family. I was so busy doing ministry. And so one, I would be at my workplace from pretty much six, because we were those who believed in going there early. So we're there from six in the morning all the way through to about maybe 17, 18. Get home, change, go to the overnights if it's a Friday. Um, if, it's, if it's weekday, I would make sure I touch base with these people at the church there. When we later on became part of uh, uh, this ministry, I then gave of myself. So Saturdays, I'm, I'm there for choir practice. <clears throat> Sundays, the whole day. I mean, we used to go get the equipment from where we used to store it. There's a good friend and brother in the Lord called Pastor Chisenga, Nwipa. And we used to go get equipment from there. And the house was the mission house. And would take this to, to the church and set up, put up all the wires. And then do the ministry, finish. And then do everything, do the meetings, finish. And then take that stuff back. If you had holidays, you know, the, the time you have holidays, like the four-day holiday you have for the agricultural show. Or the one-day holiday you have for the, you know, not the agricultural, the trade fair and things like that. That means there would have to be a conference. We would be involved in that conference stuff from the very beginning. In fact, before the conference starts, we would already be actively setting up and getting things ready. And then we'd do that whole ministry thing until the, the, the Tuesday. Every single day out there. My friends, that had a toll. I won't even lie to you. And I wish I had the guidance and individuals that could come back and tell me, my brother, the moment you chose to get married, your first wife is your family, not ministry. But unfortunately, people like ourselves were, for lack of a better word, deceived because we didn't understand. We thought we equated serving in ministry 24-7 to devotion to God. What a mistake, my friends. What a mistake. And, and to this day, I will tell you with no apology that that's the number one cause of my divorce. You see, women losing love for their husband like my wife lost love for me and, and, and went off into what, what she went off into was because I was so busy serving God. I was so busy in the church running ministry. And then when I'm not doing ministry, I'm busy pursuing money. You know, I know that there's bills. Let me pursue money. And so now the challenge was three things began to go wrong now. This is the period. And that's where I want to end. Three things began to go wrong. Number one, our business began to go to nosedive. There were so many factors I can't get into, but the bottom line is that we were being investigated because that's the time we shifted from the Chiluba regime into the Monawasa regime. And so at that period, there was a lot of bloodletting. We had very big contracts with government. And so these guys came with guns blazing. We, I, went, I attended every meet, meet, meeting from, uh, what are they called? From the task force, okay? I was called to the task force for this, that, that, all over the place. And unfortunately, what that did is our payments were frozen. We found ourselves in deep water. And the worst part is we had an overdraft of about $50,000. So this overdraft just grew into, it grew into a huge debt. 
That's a testimony for another day. God came through in ways I can't even begin to tell you. That's why I know that we know we walked with God. We walk with God. Even now, I have seen miracle money. I can't even begin to explain it. Not that fake miracle money they cheat you. Real miracle money. I've seen it. So we went through hell. Okay, we went through hell. And the business went to zero. Now imagine I'm tithing. I am so devoted to the church. There is no work that I didn't do. When I was called to do the work of God, I ran to do it at the cost of my family. It didn't matter. Now when I look back, now I understand why. But at the time, I didn't. So I was serving and I didn't understand where was this bitterness and anger coming from that my wife was showing. Dominic says, isn't it the most mistakes men of God make in their marriages is the devotion to the yes. Yes, absolutely. That's the number one mistake many pastors make. It was Miles Monroe who said, and I agree with him 100%. He said that many pastors are committing adultery with the bride of Christ. Agreed. In other words, instead of being focused and pushing their first love to their families because they chose to have a family, they instead will take that from, um, from to the church. So, you pay a price. You have a great thriving church, but you're, sorry, you have a great thriving church, family destroyed, wife gone. And so many people find themselves in that situation, then very angry children because they hate the church and they hate what it represents because it's taken their father away from them. It's taken their mother away from them. That's why many pastors' kids become the rebels they become because it's a cry for attention. It's a, 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 a lashback at the pastor or father for their attention because you ignored me. That's basically why pastor's kids become what they are. Unless they sit under a very wise man or woman of God. Nonetheless, this situation with the company went down. Then my marriage was shaking like crazy. It was so bad. It was so bad. My ex-wife stopped even coming to church because she was so pissed off. Not with anything. But now when I look back with the fact that my whole focus was just on the church until I had the big shocker when I learned that she...
And you know what the, the issue was? Those people had a fornicative affair. They were fornicating, and so the church has learned they were fornicating, so let's kick them all out of the church. So they got kicked out in, a, in the most spectacular, negative way I know. They got kicked out of the church for fornication. And then guess what? The very thing that these guys were kicked out for, the very things that our elder, those two elders spoke about, I'm just not going to name names, but anybody who knows my background knows what I'm talking about. They know exactly who I'm talking about. So these people that were kicked out and the ones that left, they told our mom in the Lord, you watch out, you see one day. And so unfortunately one day my, our mother learned the horrible truth that her husband, the bishop, the man of God, was having an ongoing affair for years, right under her nose, in her home. Because that girl was a quote-unquote daughter in the church. One of our worship leaders, very beautiful young lady. Uh, and then she's still around. Uh, I'm not going to talk, that's why I'm not mentioning names because it's just too painful. So what happened? Mom learned this. This thing hit our my busa so hard that she actually went into a coma. Like she literally got sick within a few days, had a coma. And that coma was so serious, it turned out to be a diabetic coma. She could not wake up from it. And so she was sent to South Africa, if I, if I remember correctly. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, and me being me. Because, <laughs> you know, ah, Jesus, maybe you should not have made me a skeptic. Because me being me, me, I don't take that rubbish. Sorry. I hear people going, oh, no, they're anointed of God. Rubbish. What anointed of God? When you go and do such despicable things and you're carrying the collar and calling yourself a pastor. Sorry, not in my books. You're not a pastor. You are a shame to the body of Christ because you have caused people to fall. There are people right now from my ch that church I was in who have backslidden with a vengeance because they saw what our pastor bishop did. Shameful of him. There are people who have not recovered from the hurt they're in because of what that pastor of ours, our bishop did. I talked to him, but I'll never hold him in the esteem I ever did. In fact, I'll never hold any man in that level of esteem. I was a fool to hold people in that level. And Jesus taught me by showing me, by revealing the curtain, so that I see the ugliness and the nakedness. It's wickedness, Jonathan. It's not weakness. Weakness. You know, this is what is so sad about this generation. Because do you know that when Joseph was approached by the wife of Potiphar, to sleep with him. What did Joseph, what was the words Joseph used? I cannot do this great wickedness before God. Today, they are calling it weakness. No, it's wickedness. Wickedness of the greatest degree. I have no kind words. That's why I get so worked up when I hear that there's this pastor, this bishop, this apostle who's sleeping around. For me, there is no excuse. No, he's a human being. What human being? Stop ministry. Stop ministry, become a normal person, then go sleep around. But don't you carry that name of Jesus, a caller, calling yourself a reverend or pastor, whatever you call yourself, and you're busy sleeping with people. God forbid. God forbid. So now back to my point. Mom passed out. And so there I was. In our, in our meeting, we had a meeting during our meet, we would have all the deacons and everybody in that meeting. And I was one of the leaders, so obviously, I would be in that meeting. In that meeting, when the meeting was over, I looked at everybody. Nobody was bringing it up. I said, you know what? I, um, I, don't, I don't do this. And yeah, I'm just going to say it. So I just raised my hand. Pastor, Dad, I have a question, Dad. Yes, I want us to talk about the issue of this lady and what we've heard. Is there truth to it? So I was very blunt in the meeting. And this is what... Bishop, our dad, said, he said, son, we will just wait. Mom is going to come and she's going to clarify everything because I will not say much. What I'll just tell you is that when mom comes, she's going to stand here and she'll tell you exactly what's going on. Oh, okay, we'll wait for mom. Between you and me, mom never came. Mom never came. Mom died. That's what happened. So she came back in a coffin. And so when we were done with her burial, I exited the church. I went to see dad and I said, dad, God did not tell me to, 
God, God did not tell me to sit in this church. Uh, sorry, God did not tell me to leave the church. I am leaving of my own accord because I cannot sit and listen to you and take your message the same way. It's going to mess me up. So I would rather exit. So I've come to ask for permission to leave. And then, you know, Bishop said, son, God did not tell me to, that you are leaving, but I will not force you to stay. I say, thank you, dad. And that's how I left. End of story. That's how I left the church. My colleagues and friends, a number of them remained at the church. Every single one of those people has since left which vindicates why some of us left early. I just don't believe in taking rubbish and nonsense in the name of obedience. No, no, no. We are called to be salt and light, not to be uh, chilies, sorry to say. We're not called to be rot. We're called to be salt and light that changes the texture of our environment. If we cannot rise up to that standard of Jesus Christ, we better drop these collars. Let's stop, drop these collars and stop pretending trying to teach people the ways of God when we ourselves are the biggest hypocrites. I don't subscribe to that. So saints, these three things shook me. They shook me. Okay?